Hello everyone. I'm uh, Mrs. Angela Olajibande. Our training for today is tools associated with environmental impact assessment. Also, we will be considering terminologies and its importance in environmental impact assessment. This is the training outline. We'll start with introduction. What do we mean by tools? How are they associated with environmental impact assessment? And then we'll also consider the terminologies and its importance in environmental impact assessment. Tools, as we all know, are methods or mechanisms that aid influence or informed policy and decision making process. And for the case of this EIA, it focuses on certain things that are used for policy, project, program, or plan. The formation, its implementation, and its evaluation. Tools in environmental impact assessment is rare to find a one size that fits all. So we say it's rare to find a one size fits all tool. However, the combination of all these tools at the relevant stages of the policy making process would inform a proper decision that will be made at the end of the impact assessment. Now, environmental impact assessment, which for the sake of this training, I would abbreviate as EIA, is already a standardized and institutionalized framework by itself. And then these has been in place for decades and it has been integrated in legislation and regulation for so many years. However, as a regulatory requirement for the project proponent, the procedure is usually seen as a bureaucratic order to be overcome as soon as possible. As a support to decision-making process, EIA is a very important tool that aids proper and adequate decision-making. Now, what do we mean by environmental impact assessment? The previous presenter has broken it down and um, it is explicit enough, but I will just define it according to the United Nations Environmental Program, which is a program of the United Nations that coordinates the organization's environmental activities and assists developing countries in implementation of environmentally sound policies and programs. They have defined environmental impact assessment as a tool. Therefore, the first tool that we are going to consider in this study is environmental impact assessment itself. The reason for this is because environmental impact assessment is a tool that is used to identify the environmental, the social, and the economic impact of a project prior to decision making. And it aims to predict the environmental impact at an early stage in the project planning and design. Similarly, it helps to find ways and means to reduce any adverse impact that is likely to emanate from a project. And also shape the project to suit the local environment and present the prediction and options to decision makers. In view of this, by using environmental impact assessment, both environmental and economic benefits can be achieved. Although legislation and practice vary around the world, but as a fundamental component of environmental impact assessment, it involves several stages, which the first presenter has actually dissected. So I'm just going to highlight them but I might have to talk briefly on them for the sake of those that were not here during the first lecture. The first stage that we have is the screening. 
the screening stage. And the essence of this is to determine whether a project requires a full impact assessment study or not. Then we have the next stage, which is scoping. And at this stage, we identify the potential impacts that are relevant to the legislative requirement, the international conventions, public involvement, and to identify alternative solutions to avoid or mitigate against any adverse impact of a project on the environment. And finally, it is from this coping that the terms of reference is being derived from, which is going to be used for the purpose of the impact assessment study. The next stage is the assessment and evaluation of impacts, as well as development of alternatives. And the essence of this is to predict and identify the likely environmental impact of a proposed project including the detailed elaboration of alternatives that can be considered during the project stages. Also, we have our environmental impact assessment report. And this includes environmental management plan and some other parts that, come, some other parts that makes up the entire component of an EIA report ranging from the project description, considering the legal and the regulatory framework, the potential impacts, all down to environmental management plan. Then, next to it, we have the review of this report. And this is being done after the public display has been done, in which the general public are expected to participate in it. Then we have the decision-making process, which is a stage whereby we decide whether the project should be approved for implementation or not. Then we have the monitoring, compliance, enforcement, and environmental auditing. And what we do at this stage is to monitor the baseline data of all these aspects and then to monitor whether the predicted impact and the proposed mitigation measures that occur are defined in the environmental management plan. Another tool that we are going to consider in, that is associated with environmental impact assessment is the environmental audit. The environmental audit. And this is being described as a comprehensive or systematic gathering an evaluation of data both about the environment and about the activities that is being carried out on that environment. And these environmental audits include the consequent effects, the assessment and management of adverse effects resulting from such activities. And we have a lot of projects in which environmental audits is being conducted on have the building or road construction project, the pipeline, lane, mining, manufacturing, and the likes of them. Now, what is the reason for conducting environmental audits? We have it as to assess periodically the compliance of completed or ongoing activities, which means this audit comes after environmental impact assessment because the project might have started and a lot of activities will have been carried out. Therefore, we we'll assess the periodic compliance of all of these activities with requirements of regulation and the measures proposed in the environmental policies in the environmental management system and in the environmental schemes generally. This audit has some major components. The basic component in audit starts from pre-audit and this involves examination of documents, both the financial documents and uh, the compliance regulatory documents that are present in the facility. 
It is the review of all these documents, especially by the regulatory bodies, that would determine whether such project is qualified for an audit or not. After that must have been done, then we we'll go to the audit proper, which is the on-site audit, where we check the compliance of the project activities with the regulatory requirements. Then we have the post audit. This is where we assess the performance and the results gotten from the audit that has been conducted. Another tool that we we'll consider in our training today is environmental risk assessment, abbreviated as ERA, which you can also call ERA. Now, according to the United States Environmental Protection Agency, a risk assessment is the evaluation of scientific information on the hazardous properties of environmental agents the dose-response relationship, and the extent of human exposure to the agent. Now, it is being considered that risk uh, environmental risk management involves a multi-stage analysis characterized by a risk assessment, risk characterization, and risk management. Most importantly, in environmental impact assessment studies, the guidelines of ISO 14001 is being used for impact prediction and evaluation. And during the use of this ISO 14001, there are different stages that this project and all the impacts will go through before the impacts will be categorized as either beneficial or adverse. And once risk has been assessed and characterized, the political, social, economic, and engineering implications, together with the risk-related information, will be gathered in order to develop, analyze, and compare management options. After all these must have been done, after all the impacts have been characterized and itemized, then the management measures will be developed. This environmental risk assessment has a lot of benefits. One of which is that it ensures that the level of investigation are proportionate to risk. Also, it promotes efficiency in the process because it's going to enable us, it will help us to, it will guide us to determine the impacts that are resulting from each project activity and we have a number of benefits listed up there on the slide enhanced regulatory compliance then in our project executions there is going to be fewer accidents because after assessing the risk mitigation measures would have been provided and strict adherence to this compliance would help achieve all of the benefits listed above. Meanwhile, there are some limitations to this assessment method. And the recognition of this limitation will enable the level of precision of risk management output, which is to be understood. And it will inform how the output would be used as part of the EIA. The first we have is setting the context and compiling by hand information reviewing the project and identifying risk pathways based on conceptual models, establishing a risk framework, including definitions of likelihood and consequences, reviewing and refining risk ratings, identifying mitigation measures to address key risks. Another tool that we consider is the environmental management plan, abbreviated as EMP. This environmental management plan is a site or project specific plan that is developed to ensure appropriate environmental management practices are followed during the project phases of 
started from construction phase to the operation phase to the commissioning phase, all phases of the project. Environmental management plans are being designed for each of these phases to ensure that appropriate environmental management is being practiced. And an effective EMP should ensure the application of best practice environmental management to a project, the implementation of a project PIA, including its conditions of approval or consent, compliance with environmental regulations, and that environmental risk associated with the project are properly managed. Also, environmental management plan review process is a valuable means of continually improving the effectiveness of current and future environmental management plan. Now, when several management plans have been designed for each phase of the project, a periodic review of this plan would enhance the effectiveness of the management plan that has been designed and it can enhance its update. Similarly, compliance to this environmental management plan would ensure the smooth execution and operation of the activities involved in every phase of the project. Another tool that we are going to consider is Stakeholders Engagement Program, abbreviated as SEP. Stakeholders Engagement Program. Now, when we use the term stakeholders, what comes to mind is who are the stakeholders? What do we mean by stakeholders in a project? Stakeholders are categorized into two for an EIA. We have the project affected parties and we have the other interested parties. Now, let's take a look at the project affected parties. These refer to both intended beneficiaries of the project and those likely to be affected by the project because of either actual impact or potential risk to their physical environment, health, security, well-being, or livelihoods. And these may include individuals, groups, or local communities, while the other category, which is the other interested parties, refers to any individual, group, or organization with an interest in the project. And this may be because of the project's location, its characteristics, its impact, or matters related to public interest. And these parties, for instance, include regulators, government officials, civil society organizations, NGOs, and the likes. Now, in summary, the project affected parties are those who are unlikely to be affected by the project, while the other interested parties are those who may have interest in the project, and who could, for example, one, influence the opinion of the affected parties, either positively or negatively. This is very important. These other interested parties that do not belong to the category of the local communities, individuals, they have the power to influence. They can influence the opinions of the affected parties mentioned earlier, either positively or negatively. Also, these are people who could affect the implementation process or the sustainability of the project outcome. Remember earlier, examples of those that belong to these categories, we have the regulators, we have the government officials, we have the NGOs. So this set of people can affect the implementation process of the project. Therefore, the two categories of stakeholders are to be taken seriously in every project for the success of that project. Now, we say the stakeholders of projects will vary depending on the details of the project. 
Now we'll still come to that and explain more on it. Quickly, let's look at what we mean by stakeholders engagement. Remember the tool is stakeholders engagement program. Now, when we say stakeholders engagement, now bringing into play the two categories that we recognized earlier. Now, this engagement is an ongoing process that continues through the life of the project. And this goes beyond providing information and answering questions. Because in fact, it should begin as early as possible and should also continue throughout the lifespan of the project. Right from inception, those categories of people the project affected people and the other interested people have to be consulted. And this consultation is not something that just starts at the inception and stop at the construction phase of the project. No. It goes through every phase of the project for the project to have maximum success and enjoy their benefits. Now, we say the nature, scope, and frequency will be proportionate to the nature and scale of the project and its potential risk and impact. Earlier, both our previous presenter and in the first set of slides, we talked about scoping. And that is at the initial stage when we start involving these stakeholders. And the nature and frequency of the consultation has a lot to do with the nature of the project, the scale of the project, and the potential risk and impact of the project as well. Now, when we say stakeholders engagement as a tool, what do we mean by that? EIA process should include a documented record of the stakeholders engagement carried out during the development of the project. During consultations from time to time, right from the beginning of the project, up until the, the commissioning phase and the habilitation phase of the project, Consultations we keep going with these stakeholders. And everything being discussed at each meeting should be documented. That is where stakeholders engagement program becomes a tool in EIK. Because without documentation, it has no part to play. Now, the documentation should include a description of the stakeholders consulting. Who are the categories of stakeholders that have been consulted? Where were they consulted? Where were they consulted? What was the agenda of the meeting during the consultation? What was the feedback that was received during the consultation? So a summary of the feedback would be a part of this document and a brief explanation of how the feedback was taken into account or why it was not taken into account. All of this makes up a very good tool in environmental impact assessment. Now, we'll take a look at the terminologies and their importance in environmental and social impact assessment. The word terminology itself, it means a general word for the group of specialized words or meaning relating to a particular field. Terminology is related to a particular field. And it is the language that is also used to describe a specific thing or language used within a specific field. Now, if we notice, the word special, the word specific keeps coming up. That is because terminology is peculiar to the subject of the matter. Now, in this case, we are considering terminologies in environmental impact assessment. Now, we say, for instance, special languages used by environmental specialists for EIA processes is an example of environmental terminology which are important in environmental impact assessment. Now, we'll take a look at some of these terminologies in environmental impact assessment and what each of them stand for. Briefly. The first we have here, we have alternatives. When we say alternatives in EIA, what do we mean? 
we are talking about different choices. Most especially when we are having our projects and process description. It comes up at, at site alternatives, technology alternatives. What do we mean by that? The choice of project design or site. Where else can we use a site where we have chosen that is a site of anything? What technology do we have that can enable us to achieve this outcome aside from the one we have chosen? That is what I Then we have baseline study. This is usually the top stage in the EIA process and it involves collection of all relevant information on the current state of the environment. Baseline study. Baseline. It means the environment is yet to be tampered with. The environment is yet to be tampered with. The project is yet to commence. Then what do we do? We conduct the baseline study to assess the physical properties of the environment, the physical properties of the environment, let us have information, a documented information about the current states of the environment because it is still going to be useful for us later in the future. Now we have direct impact. And this is an impact that occurs directly as a consequence of the proposed action, usually in the immediate vicinity of the project. Within the immediate vicinity of the project, that is a direct impact. It doesn't go beyond that area where the project is situated. Environmental assessment is a generic process which incorporates EIA, SEA, and other forms of assessment. That's a, it incorporates environmental impact assessment and strategic environmental assessment and other forms of assessment, any form of assessment in EIA. The EIA itself, that we stated earlier, it is a tool that is used to identify the potential environmental, the potential social, and the potential health effects of a proposed development, of a proposed project. EIS, this is a formal document that sets out the factual information related to the development and all ongoing information gathered during the Follow up. This relates to the post approval phase of EIA, which involves monitoring, evaluation, management, and communication. Our environmental audits. I said environmental audits take place after the project has commenced to assess the impact of the current activities and the one that are going to take place. That is where follow up comes from. Environmental assessment, the phase of the EI process which involves the assessment of the identified impact. Then we have the impact of this system. And it is the process of comparing the result of monitoring and other form of activities with the predictions and commitments made earlier in the EIA process. Impact monitoring, a method used to measure the environmental impact that have arising as a result of implementing the project. We have impact prediction and this is the state of the EI process where changes in the environment which will occur as a result of the development are forecasted. That is the predict. All of this comes up at the stage of environmental impact assessment. Having outlined the project design, we know the project location, we know the components of the environment, then we predict the impacts that are likely to surface after the project must have commenced. Indirect impacts, yes, this occurs away from the immediate area. Remember earlier we said direct impact, it occurs where? Within the facility. Why this occurs away from the immediate area of the proposed project. Management. We make use of management a lot. Even really the tool, we say environmental management, and what do we even mean by management? It's a mechanism for implementing the project in a way that promotes environmental protection. 
manage it. What do we do? We find and ensure protection for the environment. Mitigation. These are measures taken to reduce or remove environmental impact. There are activities or steps that we take either to avoid completely a risk or an impact. Or if we cannot avoid it completely, we reduce or minimize the negative impact. Preferred alternative. This one is the one that is the alternative that is being considered as the first choice in an EIA process. Public consultation. These has a lot to do with the stakeholders engagement. Huh? Where the public, that is those likely to be affected, beautiful, those likely to be affected by a development are contacted or informed about the project. Stakeholders engagement. Hmm? The parties that are likely to be affected and the parties that are interested. Public consultation. They are being consulted, contacted, informed about the project. We have public participation. All of these people, all the stakeholders, they participate in the EIA process. Residual impact. Now, these are impacts that still remain even after mitigation measures have been applied. They still remain after the project has been completed, after we have even mitigated those impacts. This residual impact still remains. And we say review is a process whereby the decision maker can decide if the EIA is adequate or not. The other presenter, while highlighting the process and stages in EIA, said something about final review of the project stage. This is where the review comes in. It informs decision making whether the project should. Or should not take place. Scoping the second stage of the EIA process, the other time, the EIA stages, screening, scoping. Now, scoping is the second stage of the EIA process where issues which needs to be addressed are defined and our terms of reference are being designed as well. Screening is the first stage, beautiful. We come from scaling. Then we go to stop it, whether EIA is required or not. Significance. This refers to the relative importance of an impact that a proposed development has upon the environment, taking into the account the sensitivity of the receiving environment. This will determine how significant the impact is. Then we have the strategic environmental assessment is a process used to identify the environmental consequences of policies, plans, and programs. Uncertainty. It means an issue that is raised during the impact prediction stage of EIA. It is an issue that is raised. And the issues may be unclear as to the likely effects it will have on the development. The impact analysis explains the portion of the EIA that presents and discusses predicted impact of a project. Next to it, we have cumulative effect. Cumulative effect can be defined as incremental effect of action when added to other past, present, and reasonably foreseeable future actions. Hmm? The cumulative effect comprises of both the past, the present, and the foreseeable future actions. And these effects can result from individually minor or collectively significant actions taking place over a period of time. For instance, there is a, there is, um, we are proposing to start a project in this a manufacturing project. The manufacturing industry wants to set it up here. Two kilometers away, there is another industry already. Huh? And there is a, another large expanse of land which is likely to be bought by another industry. The impact from one, two, three put together is what we call the negative impact. 
Law list regulations. These are regulations identified and then they comprise of both the federal statutory and regulation as well as the states as well as the local government statutory. That are making funds to the particular projects we are considering in our EIS. Then we have the local study area. This is the geographic area where direct effect of a specific project under review may occur. That is where the project itself is situated. Then we have the project description. What do we mean by project description? We describe the project based on the technology we are going to use, based on the site where the project will be situated, based on the operations and all the phases, the activities that we be carried out at every stage. And it is being provided by the proponent because they will have conducted their feasibility study. And when we say proponent, what do we mean by proponent? It refers to the entity proposing the development. That is the proponent. The entity, the you, the me, that wants to start the project. I am the proponent. You are the proponent. The regional study area, residual effect, review thing, terms of reference. This is a document prepared and finalized before the impact analysis, which outlines the government's technical expectations and requirements of a specific environmental impact assessment. And remember earlier when we talked about the second stage of EIA, which is scoping. This technique, this term of reference is being gotten after we have submitted report is being drawn out from the outcome of our scoping and this is what is expected to be followed strictly followed when conducting our impact assessment finally we have the supplemental information request and this is the request by the technical review team for further details of clarification of technical materials in the EIA. And this is provided after initial review of the EIA by the review team. The other time we talked about public display, and then we mentioned panel review exercise. During the panel review exercise, the other presenter stated earlier that we are going to have experts from various fields that are related to the particular project where they will sit and dissect what you have put in your environmental impact assessment report. And it is going to be confirmed to be sure that truly all the information contained in your EIA report is gotten from the site and has everything to do with the project. And all of the studies that we conduct must be in accordance with the terms of reference. With the terms of reference. After this, must have been done. After you must have scaled through this panel review process, then there's going to be a request for supplemental information, which is going to help you to flesh up your report, make it more bulky, give us additional information, extra studies that have been conducted by the proponent itself on the projects that we have to start. After all these are done, then you can be rest assured that um, an EIA approval will be gotten for the project. In conclusion, the tools that are associated with environmental impact assessment and the terminologies are very important in achieving a good and standard environmental impact assessment. Thank you for listening.